Good afternoon and welcome to the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation's webinar, Understanding Pediatric Low-Grade Glioma Types and Treatments. My name is Heather Held and I'm the Director of Family Support for the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation. Thank you for joining us today for this important subject. Before we get started, I do have a few guidelines to review. You are muted for this webinar and your video is disabled, but we welcome questions during and after the opening remarks. Please type your questions into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will not get to every question, but we'll try to answer as many as possible today. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Tab Cooney for today's webinar. Tab is now medical director at Day One Biopharmaceuticals, overseeing the Logic Firefly 2 Phase 3 trial for pediatric low-grade glioma. She was most recently assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, director of the Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Outcomes Program at Dana-Farber Boston Children's, and director of trial development for the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium. Prior to these roles, her training and early faculty careers spanned the Bay Area, including Children's Oakland, Stanford, and UCSF. She fervently believes patient and family engagement are critical to the design and execution of academic and industry trials. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today, Dr. Tab Cooney. Uh, thank you so much, Heather. Actually, we we don't even need to spend too much time on this slide. Hi, all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I think we have an hour together. And what I'm hoping to do is talk at you for just 30 minutes and give us a lot of time for questions and discussions as they come up. Um, it's such an honor to be here with you. Um, wish I could see all of your faces right now, um, but hopefully I'll get to see some at the end. So Jen, if you could go to the next slide. Um, that intro from Heather is, is uh, making me bashful. So I do need to start to uh, with today's talk, giving you a conflict of interest. Um, when Heather asked me a few months ago to talk to you, I was still a practicing pediatric neuro-oncologist, and I now am working, like she said, for day one biopharma. Um, the very last thing I would want to do is to give you any suggestion or influence of what I think about certain targeted therapies over others, since I now work for a company that makes one of those targeted therapies. So unfortunately today, I'm not going to be talking about specific names of targeted therapies or specific toxicities or efficacies of each of these targeted therapies. I'm gonna to try to span it more general for you. And of course, if you're wanting more at the end of this, please give Heather feedback. Um, so for those reasons, we'll keep it general. Jen, you could go to the next slide. Um, but like Heather said, uh, she already gave, gave you my, my story, but I, I wanted to share a bit more with you. Um, I am the older sibling of a childhood leukemia survivor. So when I was young, uh, my much younger sister did get diagnosed with a very curable cancer, uh, one that did require a lot of toxic chemotherapy and one that altered her life and our families. Um, ever since. Our families, one being white, upper-resourced, well-educated family. Um, ever since then, I've been humbled um, by the experiences of many other types of families who go through this. Um, and like Heather said, my training has then since spanned the entire country. So the reason I, I share this with you is because each of our providers' personal experiences be it their own stories from childhood or where they're trained, who they work with, influences their opinions about this disease. I've worked at four different pediatric neural oncology programs and of all the different tumor types, low-grade glioma, I find is the most varied in practice experiences and varied in opinions. Um, that not only has to do with each of us bringing our own influences to the table, but the fact that there's not many standards of care when it comes to pediatric low-grade glioma. When do we treat? When do we not treat? What do we treat with? Um, so this might all come to the table for you. And I recognize and understand that what that translates to is you might hearing and receiving varying opinions from providers, depending on who you're talking to. I do think though our own personal experiences are something that we don't speak often enough about and must be acknowledged. Could go to the next slide. 
this is what I'm bringing um, to you today. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is talk a little bit about what do we expect when we have a diagnosis of a low-grade glioma. I am going to presume that I am talking to a parent or a caregiver of a child who has been diagnosed with low-grade glioma. When Heather received the survey, that does sound like that's what the majority of this audience is. Um, and so forgive me if, if that does not um, that does not include you, but I'm going to be speaking to the majority. Um, what does this diagnosis mean? What do you think this is, is going to translate to for your child's life? Um, when do we consider treatment? What types of treatment in general do we consider? And what do we think about those treatments? And mostly, most importantly for you, what is within your family's control? What can you now have power and agency to influence for your child? Let's go to the next slide. Um, and I did receive some of the questions ahead of time. And I'm gonna do my best to answer them, but I, I, I want to also address for you, if you have a child with a low-grade glioma, there are shared experiences amongst you, but there's also many, many differences um, depending on factors we'll talk later. So I might not get to your specific story, but I'll do my best. Um, many families, when they have a child who's diagnosed, they're going to ask, why did this happen? What could I have done? Could I have prevented this? And what we generally say is that for the, the majority of tumors, to the best of our understanding now, they happen sporadically. There are certain low-grade gliomas that come from inherited predisposition syndromes, such as neurofibromatosis. But if your child does not have that, most likely it was spontaneous and it was a random occurrence that was horrific and not deserved but it happened to your child. Um, hit the next bullet, Jen. I think some things are gonna pop up. So let's pause and say, okay, what do we actually have control over here? If you're still searching for answers, if you still wanna know, um, is there a reason that they had low-grade glioma? How sure are we that it was spontaneous? What you can do is ask for a cancer genetics consult. And if your hospital doesn't have it, there's likely another hospital that does, but your doctor will tell you the mutation that's driving the low-grade glioma and whether that mutation is just in the tumor or if it's inherited in their whole body. So talk to your provider team, get the answers you want. And this is a, a heavier and more important one. And I know this is almost impossible to say, but what is incredibly important for you is to process, and you're gonna process for the rest of your life, that you could not have prevented your child from getting this. But how you endure this trauma, this is a potentially life-threatening event that happened to your child. How you deal with this and how you deal with what's to come for them over the coming years is going to have so much influence on how they grow up and their well-being. And I really, really strongly encourage you to figure out what are the best ways that you can cope with this. It is lifelong. Go to the next slide. Many of you do want some hard numbers, and it, it's not um, something I have often uh, brought to the table when consulting with families, but I did want to share some of this with you today. Um, when we talk about pediatric low-grade glioma, that is a WHO grade one or two tumor in the brain or spinal cord of a child, we are talking about largely a survivable diagnosis. So when researchers have looked at survival over decades, what they've analyzed and said is that at least 93% of children survive into adulthood. I know that's not 100%. We are doing our best to try to predict who are those children that may not survive. It is a small, small minority. But what I want you to ask your oncologist about is whether there are certain factors for your child's low-grade glioma that might give them concern that it could be um, a more aggressive tumor or might give them more risk. There are certain locations, we'll talk about this later, such as in the deep brain, and there's certain mutations that might make us think they could be more aggressive, such as CDKN2A deletions, but I want you to talk to your providing team and get those answers. For the most part, when we see a child with a low-grade glioma, we are presuming they are going to survive into adulthood. As you see on the curve, these are survival curves that academics share with each other. This is giving you, you know, at time zero of diagnosis, how many patients um, with low-grade glioma were diagnosed, and then decades later, 
how many have survived and how many have had recurrences. This is excellent work. The picture is from fantastic Canadian researchers, um, Drs. Tabori, uh, Ryle, Hawkins. Canada has a great healthcare system and they can follow people for a very long time because they're centralized. So we rely on them for a lot. What they're showing you is that a few decades out, um, at least 93% of those children are alive. However, it is harder as time goes on for us, even Canada, to keep track of children and patients. So although there was about a thousand kids to start with, three decades later, they were only able to look at a few dozen of them. So that means there's limitations to what we know about what happens later in life. We do presume that there might be activity in a low-grade glioma as our children are growing up. There is something about neurodevelopment that is driving this tumor growth. And most of us are presuming that at the end of neurodevelopment, these tumors reach a quiescence, meaning they shut off and they don't want to keep growing in adulthood. Adulthood being after 25-ish years of age. Now I'm hand-waving literally because we're still presuming this and we still need to collect a lot more centralized long-term data to be able to tell you. And there are certain factors in low-grade glioma that we don't know may influence how long they stay active for, such as the type of driver mutation and possibly the type of treatment. So talk to your oncologist about that. What I also want to emphasize here, this was work I did um, with my um, awesome uh, neuro-oncology fellow, Chantal Cacciati, um, looking at how low-grade glioma survivors um, perceived themselves. At least three quarters of them uh, do believe and identify as a survivor in adulthood. And most of them, if they experienced a treatment of some kind, such as chemo or radiation or experienced relapse, they're more likely to identify even as someone who had cancer. Now, we don't think of this tumor as a cancer in that it doesn't tend to metastasize or become more aggressive. But what this is speaking to here is how profound this experience can be for our kids. Let's go to the next bullets, Jen. I think there's a couple of things here. What this means is that when we have a low-grade glioma, a diagnosis, what we want to think about is how are we going to minimize the harm that this tumor can cause in a child as they're growing up? Also, how can we minimize the harm we're causing them as they're growing up? The harm from our treatment, our visits to clinic, et cetera. This balance can be ambiguous, um, and that also plays into why there is a bit of a varied experience. Um, depending on where the tumor is, your oncologist is talking to you um, about what harm it may be causing or might cause in the future. That can include, and a lot of low-grade glioma survivors may face this, seizure disorders, functional deficits, um, more difficulty sensing or using parts of their body, mostly their extremities, um, sometimes impacts to their vision and their hearing, uh, emotional dysregulation, regardless of tumor location, happens in many of them, because as I've said before, this can be a significant and longstanding trauma. Um, there are certain treatment toxicities based on therapy, and there's, again, life disruption happening. Um, so talk to your provider team about the risks of your child having each of these and what treatment decisions might play into minimizing each of these harms. I'm generalizing. This might not pertain all to your child, but talk about it with your team. Go to the next slide. One more bullet. Um, this plays into the data from the last slide about how us finding most low-grade glioma survivors, you know, identify as a survivor and even a majority of them as someone who's possibly had cancer. Um, what I think this translates to is um, more understanding and awareness of four families as your child is growing up about what they are enduring, an effort to minimize the emotional dysregulation and the life disruption once they are adults. You want your child to become an adult who is as healthy and as happy as possible 
this I know. Um, the healthcare teams want that too, uh, but there's you know different perspectives and time commitments that that come into play. I think one factor that seems to be a recurring theme, at least amongst the families that I've known um, and have spoken with, is that resilience um, can be emphasized and supported and uplifted. What they are going through is unique for them. Not other children have to deal with this diagnosis or deal with this treatment or these visits. And it's not fair. It is significant in their childhood, but it will influence who they are as they come up. And it might allow them to understand more about themselves, be more in tune with their bodies, um, be more aware of certain things. And I think any ability you have to uplift their resilience as they're growing up will help them. Um, what will also help is affirming repeatedly their identity outside of this low-grade glioma. Yes, they have this diagnosis. Yes, it's significant. And they are a kid like any other kid. And they have opinions and beliefs and preferences and things um, as they're growing up. If that can keep being affirmed and helping them to feel as like their peers as possible, as normalized as possible, this will help them as well. Let's go to the next slide. So many of you are asking about different types of tumors. And again, if you're coming here today, likely you have a child with a low-grade glioma and it's in a certain area of the brain already. Um, for you to know that when you're speaking to others in the low-grade glioma community, they might have tumors in various different parts of the brain. Most of them could happen in the cerebral hemispheres or deep midline, what we call diencephalon. Some of them happen in the optic pathway, some in the brainstem, spinal cord, cerebellum. For your child, it's important to know and talk to your oncologist about where this tumor is, what impact might that have? What harm might it cause to my child? It's so, so varied and influenced by where the tumor is, how big the tumor is, how old is your child, what developmental stage is your child, and is the tumor still there? Could it be fully removed? Is it partially removed? If you're not seeing any current harm, what harm might bring? to them. Your oncologist will help, should help guide you through this. But when you're talking to others in the low-grade glioma community, they might have different experiences based on different locations of the tumor. I alluded to some of the harm it could cause generally, um, but this will, this will be specific to your child and where their tumor is. There may be differences in the harm it can cause based off of the driver mutation. This is information we've only started to gain in the last decade. So there are still limitations to what oncologists know based on the driver mutations. Talk to them about this. Seek out the information. What is my child's driver? What do we know about tumors with that driver? What outcomes do they have? What treatments are available? And when we talk about treatments in the coming slides, do we know what tumor types those treatments um, were going against? And because we only know a lot of these driver mutations within the last decade, a lot of information about children from decades ago are still ambiguous to us because we did not know those driver mutations from before. Um, so sometimes we are going to hit the boundaries of how much oncologists know about the current landscape. When we receive um, a child and family with a low-grade glioma diagnosis, and depending on the age of the child, another limitation to us is our ability to know how long is the tumor gonna grow for. If a child is coming to us because of symptoms, then likely that tumor had been growing and likely been growing for some time because they grow really, really slowly. How long will it continue to grow for is often very difficult for us to know. And will the tumor stop growing and grow again throughout development. We still cannot predict this. And I think some of you asked great questions about in adolescence, is there something about this growth spurt that perhaps drives tumor growth? We don't know. We have not seen that in any epidemiologic studies. There's nothing to suggest that in puberty, there is this, this tumor um, driven growth that happens, not something we've seen, but we still cannot predict is your child going to be the one who only has tumor growth for a period of a, a year or a few years? Is your child's tumor going to want to grow 
off and on as they're growing up, we still cannot quite tell. What oncologists need to keep assessing with you is, is the tumor currently causing harm or can it soon cause harm? What is that harm going to look like and what needs to be done to minimize that? Um, there are certain therapies that we still don't know. I, when Again, when I shared the data of several decades, that data was from an era of chemotherapy, chemotherapy, and surgery. And now we are in the era of targeted therapies. Might targeted therapies alter the growth pattern? Or might targeted therapies leave tumors active for longer? We do not know because we've only been giving these targeted therapies for within the last five to seven years. So it's going to take more decades for us to know the very long-term effects of that. But it's a factor that's in our minds, as is, as is yours. Is the type of treatment going to play an effect on the behavior? Go to the next slide. Thanks, Jim. Um, I don't mean to overwhelm you with this, but it's something to share um, of what the academic community is sharing with themselves. Are there ways to stratify how aggressive a low-grade glioma is? And will that ability to predict play a role in what treatment decisions we make? And this is work also done by the Canadians. They just blow us out of the water, these Canadians. Um, Uri Tabori, uh, again, and Cynthia Hawkins and Ryle et al., based on these large cohort of low-grade glioma um, patients, they um, proposed in the last couple of years um, a risk stratification system. They proposed it. It doesn't mean that the entire community is adhering to this, but it's newer investigations brought by incredibly good experts that are having us all churning in our minds and thinking when a child with a low-grade glioma comes through our door, what are all the factors about their tumor that might make us help predict how aggressive it is, like I said before. And some of this information might be where the tumor is. Some of it is the histology of the tumor. Some of it is the molecular driver mutations. And some of it is the age of the child. So your oncologist has hopefully gone over all of these factors with you. And, and um, if not, I encourage you to keep discussing about this. What are all the factors about your child that might lead to perhaps more aggressiveness? And how does that prediction of aggressiveness play into when we make treatment decisions? This is not something that, you know, this isn't a guideline that everyone's following hard. It's just the beginning of discussions. Go to the next slide. Um, this is really hard to generalize for you because there's so many factors at play that influence these decisions. Um, but some of some of uh, some of what you have gone through or will be going through in decisions about when to treat. And this is, again, is the tumor causing harm or do we believe very soon based on how we think this tumor is growing that it will cause harm? What treatment should we do? Surgeries are highly variable based on the hospital and the neurosurgeon. And that is based on their experience. So, how many patients have they done surgery on? For how many years have they practiced? How confident are they that they can remove the tumor or remove partial of the tumor? If they do that, what are the risks of surgery? These are all things to discuss with them um, and in some instances discuss with multiple surgeons. When we talk about treatment itself, are we talking about chemotherapy, targeted therapy? Is your oncologist going to give you that off-label where they just prescribe a treatment or will it have to be on a clinical trial? Clinical trials do require more labor, often more study visits. They have to be more strict because they're trials. They have to get clean, clear data in order to better understand at the end of the trial whether something is working or working better. So what that often means is more visits for you, possibly more adherence, more rigidity in your child's treatment. But what it also could mean is sometimes earlier access to therapies that others might not have. And what it definitely means if your child is ever on a trial is that they are contributing to broader knowledge and potentially help for all the other children with low-grade glioma that are either currently living or to come. 
What does it mean for visits when we're talking chemotherapy or targeted therapy? Again, based on where you live, your lifestyle, your transportation, um, or lack thereof, this can all play an influence here, and that is expected. How often will you have to come? When you come, how long in the day is the visit? What might that mean for the days you're not in clinic? What would you expect your child to feel like? Um, efficacy. There are limits to our understanding of efficacy. We can give you several decades of data for chemotherapy regimens. That data is still limited in and of itself because we don't know based on different molecular subtypes um, at the time those chemotherapy trials were run. Um, but we can give you several decades of what survival looks like and what potentially recurrences look like across the board with these chemotherapies. Targeted therapies are newer. So when you're asking your oncologist about certain targeted therapies, talk details about the clinical trials that have been run or are running. How many years are these clinical, have these clinical trials been run for? How long, how many years of data are we looking at? What happens in the short term to these tumors? Do they shrink? Do they stabilize? And then for how long do we know? Is, are we going off of three years of experience, five years, et cetera? And what does that mean to you? The side effect profile is very easy to know with chemotherapy regimens. We've been giving them for decades and decades. They will be able to very clearly walk you through the short-term and the long-term effects of certain chemo regimens like vincristine, carboplatin, vinblastine. Targeted therapies, we are quite confident that we know at this day and age with how many children we've treated across varying targeted therapies, the short-term side effects. We know for the most part how these children feel and what they experience over the few short years that they receive targeted therapy. What we don't yet know are the effects of targeted therapies a decade, two decades, three decades later. It's just going to be a limit until we're there. Um, and then lastly, impact on surveillance. And I, I think uh, surveillance is not something we um, as clinicians have really acknowledged enough, but I've seen it as a survivorship director not only the financial and logistical impact, but the psychological impact of getting scans every year as your child grows up. Mostly on the parents, it's always the parents um, who have this at least acceleration of anxiety around the scan day, um, but it can be for children as well. Uh, I found our survivors are highly varied in how often they worry about their scans. Some only worry about it once a year, some are thinking about it all the time. Um, are certain treatment decisions going to impact the surveillance? For the most part, we think radiographic surveillance should happen through at least 25 years of age, and then we hope that these tumors reach quiescence and that these children will not need to be surveyed their entire life. And we don't know yet with these newer therapies if that might change things. Um, surgeries might impact the frequency of surveillance, simply because if a tumor can be completely removed, usually we reduce the frequency of surveillance throughout childhood. We still will survey at least until they're adults, but it might be less often. And that can be significant, like I said, through many uh, areas of health. Things to talk about with your oncologist. Go to the next slide. Oh, good, I'm right, and, and I'm running out of time here. Um, I want to encourage you, if you're here today, you are seeking more information about your child. I know you are very likely doing everything you can to best understand your child's diagnosis and to make decisions that are going to lead them to be healthy and happy. I know that. Um, what I want to encourage you to do is to build a healthcare team that you trust. And I want to give you agency in this decision. I know there's many limitations to where you live and your ability to travel, but I think building a trusting relationship with your oncologist is really critical for your well-being, your child's well-being in the long run. Um, no pediatric neuro-oncologist is in this work because they don't want the best for these children. Um, I have loved every single colleague I've ever worked with. Everybody wants the best um, for them. 
but there are often differences in personalities or preferences. And so I encourage you to keep thinking about the trust you're building with your team. Do you have that trust? What would it take to get that trust? Um, in this day and age, you can do many consultations virtually. That depends on the state and often the hospital. But if those consultations might help you get that added layer of support or trust, try to get them. Um, or even at the very least, because like I said, pediatric neuro-oncologists all know each other. We, for the most part, um, get along pretty well. You can always ask your oncologist, well, have you talked to so-and-so? Could you reach out? We are constantly, at least I'll say my academic self, we were constantly talking to each other, reaching out to each other, asking each other questions, and we're always happy to give each other's perspectives. So you can get that several different ways. Um, not only the healthcare team, but your community at large. And I, I was talking to Jen and Heather for a few minutes before this came on. I think what they're building here is, is amazing. The PBTF community, apparently they do have Facebook pages um, that are private for low-grade glioma patients and families. I think um, finding other families who are going through this experience, even if it's uh, at different times in their lives or different treatment types or locations, um, it's there's still, I think, healing in, in shared uh, collective experience. And I encourage you to seek that out. Um, I think those are the only points I have. Um, so I'll just give us a lot of time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooney, for your presentation today and the practical information and tools. Um, I really appreciate the, the parent perspective um, of the journey that they're on and the passion that you have for them. So we now welcome questions from all of you. I know there are quite a few already down in the Q&A feature. Please continue to put those in there. We already received questions from registration as well. So I'm gonna begin with one of those. Um, you did talk a little bit about targeted therapies and you talked about um, biopsy. And the question came in that are targeted therapies used if a biopsy cannot be done? Yes. Um... Such a great question. So I think there's a few a few caveats to that. Um, one point is, depending on the type of targeted therapy, is it only accessible on a clinical trial? And if so, does that clinical trial mandate tissue? So in those instances, you will have to get tissue. And the reason that protocol likely requires it is because they're only testing this drug in certain types of molecular alterations, and they have to know that your child has that. Let's talk about outside of a clinical trial. There are targeted therapies now that are commercially available and that your doctor could prescribe. What you want to know is what is known for any given targeted therapy, what is known about how it works based on the driver mutation of the low-grade glioma. How important is that in your family's decision? Because if you have your child without a biopsy, you just have a, I'm assuming a, a radiographic diagnosis of a low-grade glioma, and that can happen a lot. Um, what the oncologist would have to do is guess at the alteration that the low-grade glioma has. The majority of them carry a BRAF fusion, but um, that's about 50 to 60%. And so there are many different other types of alterations. Um, so it would be, it is a, a gamble with presuming a molecular alteration. This is for, I'm sorry, also the caveat is that this is for sporadic low-grade gliomas. If your child has an NF low-grade, your team knows the driver, even without tissue. Your team's gonna know what that driver is, and that is a different category. If it's a spontaneous low-grade glioma, and you don't have tissue, your oncologist would have to presume. And there are differences in how well these drugs work based on the type of driver mutation. So these are hard questions and decisions to be made. And I will say that based on what institute I worked at, most of our institutes did have a policy of, well, we won't give a targeted therapy unless we know the driver for these reasons. Um, I think there are some that will give it, but there is a little bit of variability there for all of those reasons. Thank you. Um, our first question from the audience today will make you smile, I think. It says, my daughter and I met you at the Jimmy Fund. We loved you. 
is pilocytic the same? My daughter was called, my daughter's tumor was called both. It was scary mm. every time I would see a different name. Yes. Um, I, I, hello. Um, I think it, semantics can be very hard. And sometimes, you know, doctors or providers have different languages that they use and language evolves. And we do need to be, I think, more cautious as healthcare teams um, in what language we use and how that can be um, upsetting for patients and families. When I say low-grade glioma, again, hopefully you've gathered that that encompasses a wide array of tumors in different locations of the brain and different drivers and different histologies, all grades one to two, but it, it encompasses a wide variety of them. The flavor of pilocytic astrocytoma is it is a WHO grade one histology, and it carries most often BRAF fusion, but other alterations. Um, the implications for your child have not changed, but as we've learned more about driver mutations, our language evolves. And so if you ever, for any of you, if you're ever triggered by a doctor using a different word or if something sounds different, just lean into it and start to ask, okay, why, why are we using these words? And what are different about these words than other words? And I will say healthcare providers, we do our best, but, but that's why language evolves. Thank you for that. Um, this question came in and you discussed targeted therapies, but the question is, what do you mean by targeted therapies? Can you give that definition maybe to parents who haven't heard it within their clinic? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So conventional chemotherapy for low-grade glioma are the chemo, the drugs that have been used for many, many, many decades, such as carboplatin, I'm going to name the most common, carboplatin, vincristine, vinblastine. These are all given through IV infusions, and they usually mean that a child has to have like a central access in place. Um, conventional chemotherapy has been given to children for over half a century. Now, in the last decade, we've developed a new class of drugs that are not the conventional chemotherapies, but rather they're targeted therapies. They're usually oral pills that go after the specific mutation that's driving the tumor. So examples of targeted therapies include dibrafenib, trametinib, selumetinib, tovarafenib. Um, I would say if you have questions about them, talk to your oncologist. Those are the types of drugs and, and rather chemotherapy goes after any dividing cell. And so for that reason, it tries to go after low grade gliomas, but it can also go after the hair, goes after the skin, the gut, um, these targeted therapies, as the name is, is um, convention, they go after hopefully just the target of the low grade glioma. They do have side effects as well. Thank you for that. Um... This question came in from a parent who says, does a child with a brain tumor always have an oncologist? I was referred only to neurosurgery. Oh, what a good question. Okay, so there are different cultural practices based on the hospital you're at. Um, I've seen this, this happen a lot, um, particularly for low-grade gliomas that, yeah, there are there are many children who meet with a neurosurgeon and then who are only followed with a neurosurgeon as they grow up. And I'm going to tell you right now, I am biased because I am an oncologist. Um, so it's hard to give you a very objective answer here. What you want to ask is if you're only followed by a neurosurgeon, who in the healthcare team is thinking about all the harms that this tumor might cause, the harms that I mentioned earlier in the presentation? Are you having discussions? no matter what your healthcare team looks like, are you having discussions about these potential harms or these potential treatments? And how do those discussions evolve as your child's growing up? In other words, are you getting the optimal care? That can be from a neurosurgeon, but I find that in many instances, um, there are many other providers that might come into the picture that could be better um, equipped uh, and be more informative for your child. I will also say, that when an oncologist enters the picture, I'm gonna acknowledge that there's, there's a lot of stigma and language there because an oncologist is a cancer doctor and your child might be in a cancer clinic and they might see other children who look very different than them. And I, that does carry stigma and carries anxieties 
that I acknowledge. And so there's a trade-off here in what those visits might look like, but then what information or support you might glean from that provider. Thank you for that. I'm going to piggyback. Um, you started to just touch on it there at the end. And the next question was, why do some doctors say that LGG uh, is non-cancerous and others say it's a form of cancer? If it isn't cancer, why are the doctors oncologists that help our children? Um, yes, this and this gets into language. Yep. Um, language is, again, language can be really variable based on where you live and language evolves. We typically in oncology think of the word cancer to mean a tumor that can metastasize. So a tumor that wants to travel to other areas of the brain and wants to grow more and more aggressively until it takes the life of the person it's in. Um, semantically, we in neuro-oncology call who grade three and four tumors, higher grade tumors, and sometimes call them cancer. And so by those semantics, low-grade gliomas, grades one and two, do not want to become typically more aggressive until they end the life. They typically don't want to spread to other areas of the brain. And that's why we usually do not call them cancer. I think it's a disservice to call them benign because I think that undermines the challenges and the chronicity that this illness uh, might mean for your child and family. Um, so that's certainly in our community, one word we're trying to shy away from is saying that they're benign tumors. This ends up being, for many, more of a chronic illness of childhood. I hope that answered the question. That does, thank you very much. Um, interesting question, again, around targeted therapy. So what if a child, a baby, cannot take a pill for targeted therapy? Do we wait until they're older or can this be a liquid? Mm. Um, and again, depending on the type of targeted therapy, there may or may not be a liquid formulation. As, as it stands now, many of them do have a liquid formulation. So talk to your oncologist or you know, talk to your provider. Um, about whether that is available. And I'm generalizing here that for the most part, those formulations are being made. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, would proton radiation be considered a targeted therapy? And have you seen results from this type? The, the reason I really shied away from using um, radiation, uh, that word in general in this mm -hmm. talk, is because in general, we have tried to shy away from that form of treatment. Um, several decades ago, radiation therapy, particularly photon therapy, was given more standardly, was given more assertively upfront. Um, when children receive photon therapy, decades later, the radiation treatment itself might bring them more risks of secondary tumors, radiation and causing more aggressive tumors, and might give them um, potential for cerebrovascular complications, such as little microbleeds or larger strokes. And depending on where the radiation is given, might mean more consequences for their thinking, learning, et cetera. Um, so we've shied away in general from radiation. Now in the last, again, roughly decade, a newer modality of radiation treatment called proton radiation has been administered more and more to children of varying cancer types. Um, Different from photon therapy, proton therapy does try to target the exact tumor to a more precise degree. So there's not this scatter that happens in other places the way proton hopefully exquisitely gets. Now, we still worry about long-term effects of proton radiation, and we don't have tremendous amounts of great data yet to compare because we've only been giving proton uh, in the, uh, like I said, roughly 10, maybe 10, 15 years. Um, there, although there is less scatter to healthy areas of the brain, one particular worry we might have is the cerebrovascular complication risk of bleeding, perhaps, or still risk of secondary tumors. Um, so for those reasons, it's largely still been reserved as um, a treatment, uh, not last resort, but really deprioritized behind targeted and chemotherapies. But I'm generalizing and your child's story might be very unique and there might be certain things about where it is in the brain. But I will say, 
if you're only with one treatment team and they are recommending radiation, um, in those instances, I would think about hearing from at least an additional neuro-oncology team just to see um, if, if their opinion is, is similar or different. Okay. Um, that the end of your answer there actually feeds into the next question. Uh, do you, as a matter of course, recommend a second opinion, even if there is a sense of trust with my child's current team? Um, what I tried to do, and again, this is my past life, um, what, what I tried to do was build um, an environment of safety and trust. And to say that I don't know you I, fully, I don't know your story. If it's going to make you feel better or make you feel more comfortable with this decision, I always encourage other opinions. Um, and you know, that also might be based on how confident am I in this decision? Is this decision I'm giving you something that our entire team at my hospital agreed on? Or is it something that's a little bit contentious? And why is it contentious? Um, so that might make you want to hear more opinions, and I would completely get that, and most of us do. And like I said, we there is a generally strong sense, like there is in the family community, there's a strong sense of healthcare provider community with neuro-oncologists. And so if you want to get a second opinion, chances are people know each other and they can even help facilitate that. So I do encourage you, when you're thinking about that, to tell your provider team, talk about it, and in some instances, they can help facilitate, be it transfer of images or notes to the other team. And it helps facilitate communication because when you get this second opinion, you're going to go hear from a different doctor. It would be wonderful if that doctor was able to talk to the one you currently have. That's only going to help communication and understanding. Absolutely. Um, switching gears a little bit here. And you talked um, a bit in your presentation about how targeted therapies are newer just in the last little bit. Mm -hmm. And so you might not be able to fully answer this one, but can you comment on what is known about targeted therapies affecting the natural history of the low-grade glioma? For example, how does the tumor act after the targeted therapy is stopped? Is that something right. we know yet or not? That is not something we know yet. And that is okay. a huge question. That's a huge question amongst um, academic neuro-oncologists as well. What happens when we stop? And the only way we're going to get at that answer is when we have enough years of larger samples of patients to study and see. Um, I put out um, a paper this last year um, from the experiences of the hospital I was at, but again, that only came down to about a dozen, two dozen patients um, looking at a couple years after therapy, that's still really, really limited in knowledge. Um, so we're doing, I will say the academic communities and the industry communities are doing their best job to try to answer these questions. And it is going to take time. Um, it's important to talk to your oncologist and see what they know and what they're talking about decisions around, well, once my treatment stops, what would lead us to start again? Those decisions are still being discussed very actively in the low-grade glioma community. Can we come to consensus around when we would decide to start again? What is it that we're seeing? So I'm sorry, I don't have the answers for you yet because they're, they're very important big ones. And every few months, keep asking these questions and hopefully more data is going to come in real time. Thank you for that. Um... Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by BRAF driver tumor for pilocytic astrocytoma? Um, if you have a child with a low-grade glioma and they have tumor tissue taken out, what you wanna ask your healthcare team is what is the driver mutation of my child's tumor? Because what is the driver mutation might influence what your oncologist thinks about what's going to happen and will influence the treatment um, availabilities. Most low-grade gliomas, we in the oncology side now know most uh, low-grade gliomas have a driver mutation that's called a BRAF fusion. That's just telling us what is the driver that's making this tumor happen. We now know that there's other types of alterations in this typical biochemical pathway called MAPK pathway just means that we know 
the most common mutations. There's usually only one mutation in a low-grade glioma that's driving it. And depending on what that mutation is for your kid, they can share with you the data over the last five, 10 years about different types of treatments and different outcomes. So ask, if you don't know your child's driver, ask your oncologist um, and ask them what that means. Um, do you recommend treating symptoms caused by the tumor location, even if the MRIs are not showing growth right now? Uh, yeah, um, possibly. This sounds like this is a, a pretty ambiguous area that, that we do often face in low-grade glioma. What are the symptoms? How much of an effect are they having on your child? And what can your team predict about how long these symptoms might happen or how, to, how they can best control them or what might these symptoms do? Are these symptoms only going to get worse? Or are they potentially stable? Um, all of this is factored in. And there are instances where healthcare teams do decide with the families to treat, even if the MRI um, is not looking yet like it's growing. Now, with that caveat, I still think we have underappreciated in healthcare how much harm we may be causing with treatment. It is, it's really significant to make a decision, say, about chemotherapy and say, now we're going to gear your child up for a year of weekly infusions in our clinic. Um, we know it's pretty safe and tolerable, um, but it is, that is still a big impact. And so you have to weigh the factors that go into each of, each of those decisions. And I, I, know, that's, I know that's heavy. Um, that is just what it is. Um, I'm gonna ask one final question. And this talks a little bit about the symptoms again. Um, early on in your presentation, you talked about potential effects of the low-grade gliomas. And this mom says her daughter is doing well overall, some hearing loss, um, but she's been struggling with dizziness and vertigo. When you talk about the healthcare team, are there any suggestions of who should be on the healthcare team that can help address? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. Because I think and, I think you lost. Her. Yeah, who's on the larger healthcare team for the families? Gotcha. Um, um, so I think we even missed a slide, but we just run out of time. So we can always hopefully maybe do this an another time as well. Um, who I had, so this is based off of my own experiences. Um, and I was obviously in a really well-resourced institute and I had the benefit of having all of these people available to help provide um, children and families with the support. It might look different based on where you are. Um, child neurologists, fantastic people. Neurologists do often help with seizure burdens, attentional deficits, perhaps challenges and functionality, headaches, pain, fatigue, and tiredness. These are all common symptoms that neurologists might help address. Psychologists, of course, do help with emotional dysregulation, psychologists, psychiatrists, community therapists. Most healthy children in America right now are suffering from mental illness. And so chances are your child might have some of these challenges and you might wanna ask yourself, what are the best, what's the best emotional support for my child? Um, neuropsychologists do help test your child's thinking and learning. And if you have one, I hope you could have one available to test your child at various points as they're growing up. It will be very helpful and informative for them to know how they're thinking, how they're processing their memory, comprehension, speed, all of those things, especially at big educational transition points for them into high school and then possibly into college if they're interested in college. I really encourage them. Nobody likes neuropsychological tests. They're a pain in the butt and they're really long and boring. Um, but I really encourage kids to go for this. And I try to reduce the stigma around it. And I say, if I had the ability to know more about how I think and learn and to develop perhaps some practices around helping me think and learn, I would have gone for that. And that's even for someone who have a really high education level. Um, if you have school liaison supports, go after them. Talk to your, if you don't, talk to your pediatrician about supports through the school, if they're needed, if they could help, et cetera. Um, and if, if your child, while we're on the subject of college, if they're thinking about college, 
um, talk to the college um, educational, um, talk to their department about any supports they might have. And again, in reducing stigma, it's all about your child getting access to what might, might be the best support system for them so that they can thrive just like any other kid. Um, so I said, neurologist, psychologist, neuropsychologist, potential, you know, your child might have hormonal imbalances, endocrinologist, depending on functional deficits, rehab, uh, physiatrist. Um, I am terrified I'm missing someone. Um, social work, of course, depending on resource specialists, social works, they're so critical and they're so um, under supported. I think that's the most part. Thank you. Um, and we have actually, we are at the end of our time today. I know we still have 30 questions sitting in there. Um, I'm going to pull the questions out after the webinar. I want to thank you again, Dr. Cooney, for sharing your time today and your expertise and experiences with us. Special thanks to Day One Biopharmaceuticals for their support of this important webinar and Brain Tumor Awareness Month. And I want to thank all of you, our attendees, for your participation and your thoughtful and extensive questions. The PBTF is here to help no matter where you are in the journey. Dr. Cooney mentioned we do have several groups that are available for you to participate in. We have some educational material, um, and we also are a sounding board for you. If you have questions along this journey and you're looking for extra support, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'll be sending you a link to the recording of the webinar within the week, and I will send you the slides from today's presentation as well for your reference. Thank you all and have a great afternoon.